Melinda, as you can guess, we are doing full-blown construction, so we may be interrupted from time to time. What are we going to talk about today? Well, I wanted to give an update of uh, all the things I've been implementing and learning because there's been a lot of things I've tried and failed and had success with. So I just wanted to share um, some of that, and I'm sure some things are going to pop up while we talk. Super. Let's dive right into it. So last time we talked, I know we had a we had an episode with Rahul talking about YouTube. We're still researching, talking about that, trying to fit it into where both of our goals are and trying to align it with where do we both want to head with our careers and what do we want to do um, and how can we fit that in? I know when I was talking with you previously before that, we were talking about how to uncover my audience's pain points to move all the way back to the place where they felt rock bottom. So I have been implementing that more in my social media strategy, specifically in Instagram, and have gotten so much more engagement through doing that. So really sharing stories of when I felt like I was hitting rock bottom. I've also been sharing a lot of those types of stories in my newsletter. And in mixing that with also practical things. So I inter, intersperse like some stories for, for connection and empathy. And then I also, the things that I'm learning currently that are actually working for me, I'll teach that as well in my newsletters. So that's been a win. That's been a huge win. So both with social media and then with the, the newsletters too. And I'm learning how to funnel people from the ones who just become aware of me. So using Instagram as the awareness part of the funnel and getting more um, followers and new people, new eyeballs on me and my content and then funneling them to actually take a call to action. So whether that is, usually it's jumping on my um, newsletter or it's funneling them to a specific blog post which then I know we had talked about this, giving a free something like a lead magnet of some sort to get on my list. And so I've been doing this with my blog post. So I have a blog post that's high value. And then at the end, if they wanna take the next step to actually implement whatever I I showed in the blog post or something like that, if they wanna take the next step to implement or learn more, then they can hop on my email list and I'll deliver whatever that is. So I make specific what's called content upgrades per blog post, or at least per the good ones, because not all of them are high ranking. So no use wasting time on that. So that's been also a big win. And I've almost doubled my email list size since we've last talked with doing all that, optimizing my site, Uh, to get people on my list. And then um, I've also tried some other things like asking my my audience what's going on, what are they dealing with, listening to them, and then providing even more um, content. So I did a group call with some people from my newsletter about lead generation. And then from there, I realized that people were needing some more help with it. So I offered, I just put together a quick landing page for a wait list for a potential e-course. Um, or it's like a group coaching to go through what I had taught to help them implement. So I also have been, have been doing that. So it's a lot of listening. It's a lot of sharing my story and meeting them where they're at. And that's all been working really well. Well, that's great. So far, so good. Yes. Have they taken any action since getting into this whole content stuff that you're putting out there? There's two things that are currently um, they're purchasing. So one is still the paid Facebook group that I have. I open that enrollment every three months. And so I think I had one of my highest enrollment months um, as far as people and income the last time I opened it, which was beginning of April. Mm -hmm. And that is that comes from the newsletter. So that's one. Um, The other one is the lead generation wait list those people so once i actually put together what that's going to look like the e-course or the coaching um they will be purchasing that or i will be pitching it to them to see if Great. if they would like to go forward with that okay sounds really good sounds like you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing thank you <laughs> i'm still moving forward with all of those things and i think things are clicking now for me i think the big thing too the big breakthrough i had was the funnel because I kept thinking that my Instagram and my social media was 
the relationship builder. And I know this was something that you were trying to get through to me that I could not understand. It's that you have to use that as, it's almost like the megaphone to get the newer people to find you because you have to have the biggest numbers at the top of the funnel. You have to have like the people that are following you on social media. So that was a huge wake up call that once I got that, then things started falling into place that I understood, oh, I'm supposed to fill the top of the funnel. It, it's like all the things that you know in your head, but then when you actually implement all of it, it all does fit together. And then I realized, oh, so if I get the newer people, they felt understood, they, felt, they feel heard and that I get their story because I had a similar story or have a similar story. Then I know, okay, this is where I'm gonna meet you. Now here's the next step in this journey. And I'm, I'm understanding as I do it to funnel these people to the next step that they can take. And learning that the next step's probably a blog post it talks about what they could do or how they could implement, you know, whatever issues they're having and then moving them forward in there. So I'm understanding it as I experience it and as I okay. implement. Okay, so let's make an assumption that not everybody's watched every episode we've ever done together. Can you summarize what you used to do or think and then what you're doing now in terms of growing your Instagram followers? Previously, I was sharing more of what I'm currently doing and what I'm thinking and what I'm learning at this very moment. So as a brand strategist, I was sharing more. Um, I mean, I've gone through a lot of iterations of what I've shared on Instagram, but that was where I was getting stuck. Um, that I had a lot of people, I had some engagement, but I've the big turning point was going back to when I hit rock bottom in my own career and in my case, because I am wanting to attract more designers, it's it's easy to think back at my own career. Whereas if you're talking to clients, you'd wanna think, when is their rock bottom? So I thought back at my rock bottom and I'm sharing more stories way back like 10 years ago when I wanted to quit design. And so there was a big shift from sharing more of the day-to-day, -day, what's going on now and what I'm learning and thinking now to when I wanted to quit design altogether and what I was feeling and what I was going through and what I experienced. Okay, so your original intent on Instagram was to build a relationship with clients. Now your relationship with, which is with fellow creatives and it's a big shift, right? Yeah, I would say even um, previously before I had the shift, I was trying to attract designers. I don't think I ever used Instagram really to attract clients. I'm thinking back. I don't think I ever did really. When I started really getting an Instagram was designers, but even then I wasn't speaking to them. I wasn't meeting them where they were at. Okay, so that's the big shift, meeting them where yeah. they're at, not where you're at yeah. now. Right, right. So not meeting them where I'm at, meeting them where they're at. Okay, so it's you going back into time and trying to uncover or remember all the things you didn't know back then. Because it's easy for us, and we talk about this, as, I've been thinking about this a lot, about how experts don't make great teachers, but people who are learning in the journey themselves make the best kinds of teachers if they have that mindset. And I'm thinking about this because I want to make a slide on this. I want to think about like, if you could have Van Gogh as a teacher, what might that experience be like? Well, his advice might be for you to cut off your ear, drink a lot, fall madly in love with people, and then just paint. And if you, if that works for you, then you would do that. But then I think about somebody like Bob Ross, the famous Bob Ross with his big fro. He was just saying, let's make happy trees and happy clouds. And he's very processed and, and his content is much more relatable because it's, we don't necessarily consider him a master. What he does, he tries to break down in simple bite-sized pieces so that you can follow along. And that's the beauty of Bob Ross. Exactly. So I guess I want to be more Bob Ross. Yeah, so just put on the wig. <laughs> <laughs> but that has that approach has not only it resonates with me as a teacher and a learner but it also is engaging to my audience and helpful to my audience i've noticed that too because a lot of times i'll think gosh well i'm not the expert i want to be who am i to be saying this but then i see the progress they make and i see how much they they need to feel and same with myself we have to feel understood and that we're not crazy for the things that we think and feel. And when we feel accepted, we can then move forward. We can actually take that first step of action. At least that's how it has worked for me. And it has, I'm noticing that's the same thing with 
the people who are are buying into the content or taking action on the content that I'm putting out to you. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, so what else did we talk about? Well, I remember a few few calls ago, you were talking about how you wanted to have a discussion about the people who don't, what was it? You said that some people have to learn through experience. Yes. And other people just need to be told. Yeah, like a kinesthetic learner. Right? Yes. Right. So can we talk about that? Because yeah. I, I would love to talk about different learning styles. Mm-hmm. And I know that you're very passionate about that subject in particular, but I'd like to continue that. Sure. Let's pick it up from there. So the different learning styles. There are a lot of different theories on this, and I'll just share with you one of the theories, which somebody shared with me, and I've adopted it to how I teach both in person and online, if possible. So the first type is the person who is what I would consider a very high level person. They can read a book title, they can look at the table of contents and not have to read the whole book to understand the meaning of the book itself. So they just want the high level stuff. So people who speak at TED, who attend TED, I think are those kinds of people. And there's the other kind of learner which learns through stories. And this pretty much encompasses everybody in the world, I think that when we hear a story, we can discern meaning from the story. That's why parables are so powerful and have uh, existed throughout history. And when we watch a movie, we're connected to the story because humans seek pleasure while trying to minimize pain. So when we see a character struggling with their own self-acceptance and we see that if they learn to love themselves, then they have a happier life. And so we can experience the lesson without the pain. And I think that's why stories are so powerful in all all formats from books to movies to plays and everything else in between. Lastly, there's a kinesthetic style of learning, which is you have to do something. You actually have to do something with your hands. It's, It's very experiential. So these types of learners tend to not want to listen to the high level stuff because like, yeah, well, that worked for you. But but they always insert the but. And the stories are good. They can learn some things. And then they wonder to themselves, I wonder how this applies to my life, if this is possible. So then they go out and they try it themselves. And only through doing it themselves, in whatever fashion that you can think of, can they actually absorb the lesson. Speaking from a purely design point of view, when you do the design work and the teacher critiques it, it feels connected to you and your work and you feel like you can learn only in that way or most powerfully in that way. Whereas when the teacher critiques somebody else's work, you can hear the words, you can kind of understand the concepts, but you're like, well, I can do it differently. It's not, that doesn't really apply totally to me. That worked for that person in that situation. So I think that's where some of the struggles come in. Now, speaking specifically about you, I think you are a kinesthetic style learner where I'll tell you stuff, the high level, you may agree, you may disagree, who knows, but until you actually do it yourself and see the results for yourself, then you won't totally 100% accept it to be true. And when you want to teach people, you don't want to assume they're one type versus the other because we're multifaceted that way. We could be a little bit of each or predominantly one or the other. But when you want to teach somebody, you might say, here's what I'm going to tell you. And then you tell them a personal story and some examples. And then you give them very tactical things that they can do themselves so that they can experience it. So everybody... Uh, lace your fingers together, right? And then alternate the way your fingers are laced. So if you go like this, then now you're going to experience some form of discomfort. It's odd that some people are right-hand dominated or left-hand dominated, and they lace it in a particular way. And if you alternate that, it makes you feel really uncomfortable. Like it feels really foreign to you. So now you can understand the concept, the high level. There's a story and there's something for you to do and try. So if you can design all of your learning lessons to include all three types, you're going to do really well. So can you give an example of something that would include all three types? So high level is like we got to go out of our comfort zone that the smallest amount of change in your life can have the biggest impact in your life. So now I'm going to tell you a story about how something happened in my life. And then I did this thing and this one little change of agreeing to say, get on a camera and record videos for YouTube ultimately changed the very course of my entire life and career. And to experience this for yourself, I just want you to try this thing and lace your fingers together and then alternate it. And you can Mm -hmm. see that that little level of discomfort is enough for you to not want to hold it there. But I want you guys to stay in it and hold it for as long as possible. So that would be the example. Got it. Got it. Not a great example, but I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. So when you had brought it up before, 
I sensed some, mm, what's the word? Irritation, frustration, annoyance with the kinesthetic learner from you. I, I think I would use the word confusion to describe confusion. it. Confusion, okay. Yeah, because to me, I'm a shortest path between two distances, a straight line. And the kinesthetic learner is a very meandering path. It kind of wanders throughout and doesn't quite find its spot. And to me, I'm totally about efficiency processes and just optimized results. So when somebody tells me, Chris, in order for you to grow to the next level, we have to do public speaking. That's really all I needed to hear. And then I go out and do it. The kinesthetic learner needs proof after proof. They're, they're like very skeptical about everything because nothing works and only if it's applied to them. So it's hard for me as a type one learner where I can mm -hmm. just take the high level concepts and then to work with a type three learner, which is this kinesthetic person, because I was thinking we're wasting a lot of time. If you have that kind of time to, mm -hmm. to spend, be my guest. I don't, I got to move on because I need to talk to people that can learn quickly. And it turns out at my mm -hmm. own in my own class at Art Center, I had devised a test to see which type of learner they were without telling them in any judgmental way, one is preferred over the other. And the dominant response was type three learner. So we are ideally not suited for each other. That's the problem. This is why I often say that I'm the worst kind of teacher because I expect to give a really condensed small piece of information and for somebody to just grab it the way that I've done and then run with it. And so when I have to sit there and explain it and prove to them over and over again, and we get in these long protracted debates, it becomes wearing on me because I think I need to spend my time elsewhere. So that's where the confusion comes in. And you may notice some friction because I'm like, why can't you guys get it? And they're like, well, why can't you get it? And that's the problem. Interesting. So you had said that sometimes the kinesthetic learners are a waste of your time. Have you ever felt that way with me, Chris? I, I don't know. It's, an, it's not a waste of my time. I, let me just rephrase because I just want to make sure everybody understands that it feels like we could be doing so much more with so less time or, or mm -hmm. much less mm -hmm. time. And that's, that's mm -hmm. where like, I want results. I want movement. I want, I want change. I want momentum. I want to break inertia and I want to move. Right. So we get that. So with you, and, and this is just me on my growth towards becoming a better instructor, is to say that each person arrives differently with a different mindset. They want different things than what I want. And I need to learn to be empathetic. I need to slow down. And I need to try to teach people in ways that are good for them, not good for me. So that's just my own growth arc. Now, to answer your question, have I ever been angry or frustrated with you? Um, I, I wouldn't say angry or frustrated, but I'm like, I wonder when Melinda's going to get it. And I, I've... I know this is going to sound terrible of me to say it. Like, eventually you'll get it. I'm just sitting back and watching this almost in amusement. That's why you see me smirking a lot. Because I think I you don't get it right now, but you will. And I have time and it seems like I have the su supreme belief that I am correct and that eventually you'll <laughs> get there. So that's why you see me smirking a lot. So what is it that I'm not getting? Today? Yeah, like right now, like when you said. Oh, I nothing right now. I haven't got it yet. It's just, no, no. Like just whenever overall? something, whenever I throw a new idea at you. Oh, got it, got it. Okay. So I see it like this. I see it like this. Like I've gone through the forest many times before and I've figured out the most optimal way for us to go from this point to that point for maximum results, least amount of pain. And this group that I'm leading, some will follow me exactly as I prescribe. And those people tend to be the ones that I report back to everybody that have had the most success. Like I say, do this and they just do it. And then there's everybody else. And there's there's shades of like how quickly somebody can grab onto an idea. You notice if you watch videos about us talking about value-based pricing, not charging, charging by the hour, you notice how many people fight me in the comment section? Oh yeah. Yeah, if you ever read that, yeah. you're like, oh, well, why are you so invested in doing things that way versus doing it in a more optimized way. I just, I don't get it, but hey, to each their own. And I'm totally okay with that. If you want to stick to your guns and stay the course of charging by the hour, that's your right. That's your prerogative. But for everybody else, hey, come join me. It's a, it's a lot, it's a lot nicer in the sun than it is kind of in the dark, cold wetness. But if you want to stay there, it's totally fine. So as of right now, I don't think I'm telling you anything that you're not doing just yet. I can't think of something, but I'm sure the next time we have an opportunity. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> I'll bring it up. And then you're like, nah, I don't know. I don't know. But 
And then eventually you're like, okay, so three months later, I'm doing that thing that you told me that I should do and I didn't want to do. And here we are. And that's totally okay. I just found it interesting because I know that you've mentioned it a couple times about the the person who has to learn through experience mm-hmm. that I just sensed some annoyance or uh, mm-hmm. it's actually more annoyance than confusion. Yeah, I, okay. On, what I sensed, but I was just curious about that. It could be annoyance because how... after a while it's like, dude, are you going to get it or not? It's up to you. I got, I got to spend my time somewhere else, right? Yeah. So now going back to how we're actually using this and creating content and connecting with people and helping them. But now knowing that most of the people that you were teaching and maybe the, ma- the majority of people are kinesthetic learners, how can that now help us to connect more with our audience or to, to help more people really? Right. If we know that. If we know that about them, yes. then shouldn't we be? Okay. So a couple of things, yeah. Thing number one is this, the the sample size in which I'm giving you this data on is fairly small relative to the size of the world. So we're talking about, I I would have 10, 12 students at a time, give them the test and then they would take it and then make some evaluations based on that. And when I say most, I would say like most of the design students who get into Art Center who are bold enough to take my class come out with this kind of result. So there's a lot of conditions, there's a lot of commas and an asterisk is put on this, right? But let's just assume that we need to learn to teach the maximum number of people. So whenever we're trying to teach a lesson, we need to include as many facets that hit the different types of learners as possible if we want to be effective. So regardless if the data says that this is the type of learner we hit, if we want to teach the maximum number of people, we tell them very high level, here's what you do. So here's an example of this, okay? Instead of teaching what you know, teach while you learn. There's a big difference. And I'm gonna get into a story and I'll tell you the story about what I learned by doing this, right? I'll ask a lot of introspective questions so that the audience can think about what it is that they're going through. And then now I can give them some very concrete steps on what to do. So this part gets really tactical, like step one, try this, two, three, four, five. And so I can create a framework or a process chart or something like that so they can try it. So yes, conceptually, I think I understand, but I really don't know if it applies to me. They can can go out and literally do those things and then say, oh, I think I'm supposed to teach while I learn and not teach what I know. Somehow they bring it back full circle and then everybody wins. So I'm including this now in my lectures. And when we're doing coaching, I try to give people things to do, things to make so that they can experience the lesson firsthand. Yeah, because it's almost like getting someone to think it's their idea. Like they have to, and I've heard this from what Jordan Peterson has said this too, that someone, you have to own an idea. And so until you actually can put it in your life to understand it experientially, then you actually don't own the idea You're for yourself. And so it's almost like that transference of the idea from you to them. And then once they actually experience it in however you've um, whatever steps you gave them, then it becomes their, it's almost like their idea and they can own it and then take action further on it. That's kind of how I'm understanding it. Yeah, I guess it could be like a vocabulary word that you can understand it. You can take a quiz on it, a test, but until you start to use the word in your normal everyday dialogue, then you really don't know the word. Right. So they need to do something with it. That's natural. I understand that. So that's how I'm seeing more of the kinesthetic learner rather than. But I hear what you're saying about the when you get comments from the value based pricing and you're just getting objection after objection after objection. To me, they won't want to take on that new idea. To me, that that shows more of a resistance of change and not necessarily that they're just a kinesthetic learner. Does that make sense? That word. Well, going back to that they're, idea. they're kind of related if you think about it. Yes. So when somebody hears an idea and they fight you on it, what are they fighting? They're fighting change. They're fighting their belief system because as we've talked about this before, our understanding of the world is very finite. What we know and understand is very small. So we rely on a belief system and and that's how we get through life. Like you don't know, you don't know for a fact that staring into the sun will burn out your eyeballs. You've been told that. And the only way you can prove that to be true is to stare into the sun and see what happens, right? So we have to rely on somebody else's information and say, you know, if you look at the sun, it'll damage your eyes. And some idiots during the eclipse, they look at the sun without their sunglasses on and they damage their eyes. Now they know. So what happens is our 
worldview, our belief system gets challenged when we hear something new, small and big. If you are a climate change person and then somebody says to you, that's not true, it's all just mumbo jumbo, you're challenged and you want to close it off because your belief system becomes part of your own identity. So when they hear that, they're like, no, that can't be true or it's true for you or it's true for somebody else, but it's not true for me. And that's the first initial thing is denial. And denial turns into anger. It's like, no, your thing now is threatening everything I've ever done. So did I waste my entire 30 years or 40 years of my design life by charging hourly when I could have been doing value-based pricing? And I don't want to admit to myself or to the world that I was not smart about how I built my business. So we shut these things down. Until you can experience it yourself in whatever fashion that you want, you just want to close down those ideas. And this is pretty natural, I think, to how human beings work. Now, I think this idea of being a critical thinker, which most of us want to be able to call ourselves, consider ourselves as a critical thinker. A critical thinker is a person who can entertain an idea that's foreign to them in their own mind as if it were their own and go through a very systematic process of breaking the idea down, trying to prove it true, or to, to, to disprove it. If you can't disprove it, you adopt that idea and you throw out the old idea. And you'll see me do this quite often. If you, if you look back about four and a half years ago, Jose and I were talking about salespeople and how to sell, and how to close and how to present yourself. And my attitude towards him at that particular time was, I don't do sales, my sales reps do it. And he's like, well, Christelle, you'll never understand this until the day that you have to sell. Well, after some point, I started to learn how to do the sales conversation and I got really good at it, right? So once you do it, you start to experience it. You say, okay, well, what do I need to learn now? And then you acquire the skills that you need to. And then you seek guidance from people who are mentors or potentially more experienced than you in these kinds of things. And you learn from them and then you start to do that. And so when I rewatch that video, it's funny because I've now come full circle on that to say that I didn't know what this thing was. I started to investigate it. And the more I found out about it, I was able to throw away an old idea and bring on a new idea. So this is about, what is that called? Mental elasticity or whatever that word is. There's a, there's a term for it, how malleable your mind is. And I think what we want to do is hold strong beliefs loosely. Like we want to have very strong opinions about things. But when a better idea comes, we just let that one go and grab the new one. That makes sense. Yeah. That's cool to see your transformation too. You know, and you've seen it, right? It's documented. Yeah. yeah. Well, and even since I've known you too, I think there's some things that have changed since then. So for me moving forward, is there something that you would recommend that I could practice? Yes. Okay, go for it. <laughs> Do everything I tell you the first time. Okay. That's it. That's a good... Now, I'll tell you a story. Ben Burns and I are having a conversation one night, and I tell them, literally, I can't work with you, fire all your clients. And he says, in a very quick moment, how should I fire my clients? And I tell him how to do it. The next day, he called up, he made 53 phone calls the very next day. Now, this person doesn't even need to know, like, why do I have to fire my clients? They don't even need to know the ins and outs, the pros and cons, but what they did was they just took massive action. So this is the wonderful thing about what I would consider the truth. The truth doesn't need you to know that it's true for it to be true. If Mars is red, you don't even, you could be totally colorblind, but it's still red. It doesn't matter if you believe it to be true or not, it's still red, right? So Ben in this situation doesn't need all the evidence. There's a gut that says he's probably right. Then he decides to take massive action and the very next day changes his life because he fires all of his clients, three of them stay on and, he, and his life is transformed and everything else falls into place. I have other people that I coach that move that fast. When I say, do this, Chris, are you sure? Yes, and then they just do it. Sometimes they don't even ask, are you sure? And with these people in particular, I have to be very careful about what I say because there's a high chance, high probability that they're going to do exactly what I tell them the very next minute they get the opportunity to. And you know this because uh, I've shared the story about Carrie. Miss Carrie was stuck on our pricing for a really long time. I challenged her belief system and she finally accepted it and then decides the next day she's going to try to do this and charge more money. And she asked for double what she was getting and she automatically then doubles how much money she made in that year. And it was just about a belief followed through with massive action. Now, here's the interesting part. 
is that this story, the, the thing that I told her that triggered her to change could have been completely 100% fabricated. So this idea of truth and universal truth, it's it's kind of very murky. It, it doesn't even matter if it's your truth, it works. What do you mean by your truth? How do you de- how do you define it? When you believe something to be true, then it can work for you. Uh, we, we rarely ever do what our mind and body do not commit to doing. So if you say it's not going to work and I send you into the field and you try and you know in your mind it's not going to work, it's stupid. So the way that you ask for it seems like defensive or ap- apologetic. And then the client's like, no, I don't want to work with you. And you come back and you say, see, I told you it's not going to work. Well, how many times did you try? Well, I've tried once. It's one time how many times you want to try before you believe something to be true. So you almost self-sabotage at that point. So it starts with the mind. You must believe it to be true. The body starts to listen to the mind and then you will it into becoming true. That's what happens. What do you think the belief system then is of those who do take massive action very quickly? I think for them, they have been rewarded in their lives when they let go of an idea and they know that what they have right now is not what they want more of and they've hit whatever point. And they're open. They're so open. We mostly make changes in our life because one, our heart's been broken or two, our mind has been opened. It's pretty polar in that way. Your heart's been broken and your mind's been open. So people who take massive action may have had their hearts broken quite a few times or they're they're like painted themselves into that corner where now they have no option but out. And so they choose now any option but to stay where they're at. And that's the critical part. The other people, hopefully, if you're more enlightened and you can just say, you know what? I choose to keep an open mind about everything because, heck, who knows if anything is true? And science and our understanding of the world is changing almost every single belief we have, right? The more data, the more we can measure things, the more we understand the world, it goes back to challenge long-held beliefs. So if you know this about the way the world works, is why wouldn't you be more open to new ideas? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're seeking that information from somebody. It's one thing to say, look, every piece of information I hear, I'm going to try. Well, I don't think you want to do that per se. Let's say that you're a fan of the channel and you're listening to this. You think, well, most of what he says is pretty good. Why don't I just trust this person that they have good intentions and they're trying their best to help me? Why don't I just do it? Just go for it. And you can even see within the large group that we've amassed in the pro group is that there's still a handful, a very small percentage of people who just do and execute and are achieving the kind of results that we want them to achieve. And then there's the people in the middle who are like, I'm thinking about it. I want to do it. And then there's the last group who's like, that's not going to work. It's just not going to work. So it's not going to work because you believe it's not going to work. That's just as simple as it is. Well, I think you brought up something that also ties in with what we were talking about at the very beginning that those who take massive action either have and their mind has been opened or their heart has been broken i think that i love that that you said that because it it directly relates to why talking about the car crash like the the pivotal moment in our stories or the time that we hit rock bottom is so important because the people who are open to that or to open to doing something about it are the ones that are at that moment too. And that's why I think it reinforces the idea that we need to go back to meeting someone where they're at in the rock bottom because those are the people that are willing to take the massive action. Yeah. Not the people that are in the middle that are like, yeah, life's okay. Things, yeah, I would like to make more money, but it, there's no compelling reason for them to actually move on it so i think what you said it just it ties everything back to the beginning of we have to meet people where they're at right so determined sales is called compelling event people don't change unless there's a compelling event a compelling event is one that propels you forward to make change because you want it to happen because things are happening around you and you have no choice at this point so you're looking for that the catalyst that splits the road into two paths the left, the one that goes to the left and the one that goes to the right. And in business terms, if you have a compelling event, a compelling event could be you're launching a new product. So now you have things that you must do for it, develop a name, a brand, marketing materials, et cetera. Or it could be that the company is going through some hard times and is downsizing. That's a compelling event. 
or the, the, the company is experiencing explosive growth, change is happening. So when we're kind of just cruising along, being complacent with our lives and everything seems to be okay, not horrible, not great, which I would describe the vast majority of the population, at least in the United States, I know that's a broad statement, that everybody's just okay. They're not miserable. They're not killing it. Until those people start to wake up and realize, you know what, I want more for my life, this very precious life I was given. And then they're, they're not very likely to seek change, want change, and to put in the work because it's nice to be comfortable. It's nice to follow along in the status quo. That's just the reality of it. Every time you do something new, something different, something bold, it means you run the very high risk of totally failing. The, the bigger the innovation, the greater the potential for failure. And we're uncomfortable with failing. And that's why I think culturally, we need to change this idea of what failure means. Because failure and success, failure and invention, they're inseparable twins. That's a Jeff Bezos quote. And so you need to embrace failure as much as you do innovation. If not, you're truly not innovating. Blair Enns was on our show recently. He said that innovation is messy. It's nonlinear. It's wasteful. And you have to be willing to do that. And if you want to be an innovative company, you have to embrace that as part of a process. So I think what would be interesting for us to consider as educators is to try to put young people, and when I say young people, seven, eight-year-olds, into situations that they fail massively, but they're not given a low grade. They're not discouraged through condemnation and critique, but they're like, wow, what a big idea you went for. That was amazing. You made the most daring move. You get the A. And then conversely, the people who just stay the true course, they get the worst grade. We need to flip our idea around what success means. And this is the reason why I'm going on a tangent here. Why I feel that all the innovation, all the creativity has been squeezed out of us through our school system. Because we're taught, if you follow these orders, if you do exactly as you're told, you will do well in life. And that's the wrong operating system, period. Well, definitely. It's like I've heard of some teachers, too, trying to um, come in and give A's first. And so you either keep your A by your by your effort and, and the risk that you take and the failures that you make. So they start them out instead of having to earn it later. Mm -hmm. That they're like, hey, you already made it. So now you need to keep innovating and be okay to fail. And so I've heard of a movement of teachers doing that. You know what's really interesting is we have staff meetings at our office fairly consistent, right? And when we're talking, it's usually me, Ben Burns, Matthew and Cena, Greg Gunn, and Mark Contreras. And we're usually in the room, we're bashing out ideas all the time. And, and recently, uh, after Debbie Millman was interviewing me and she had said, Chris, you're an optimist. And she caught me a little off guard because I, I never thought of myself as an optimist. And then Matthew came up to me right afterwards, like, I guess you are the optimist, Chris, and we're the pessimist, Ben and I, because we keep fighting you on the ideas that you want to try. Right. And I just didn't like, OK, maybe I didn't. Just, I thought we're all ready for a massive change and disruption always. I just didn't even look at it as that's being optimistic because for me, that's my status quo. To try to challenge everything is normal. So I'd even, I wouldn't even label it in my own mind as optimism because I always believe everything will work out. I guess that's the definition, right? And so during our staff meetings, I'll talk to the team and I'll say, guys, I had this uh, realization that I think what you guys are calling innovation, I'm calling iteration. You just want to do more of the same. And I said this, like every year we expect ourselves to grow 300% from a revenue point of view. But what do we do in these meetings? We say what worked last year, we do a little bit more of the same. So to me, that's iterative. And that is a direct conflict with our growth goal of 300%. Like we can't be the same company, the same people, use the same products and the marketing strategies and the same content if we expect to grow 300% every single year. We have to be much more innovative in our mindset. So please cleanse your palate. Think about things are, that are super scary and crazy that nobody would think that this would work. I'm gonna entertain those ideas only. 
And so it took a little while for that to seep in because that's asking everybody to throw out every playbook that's ever worked for us and try something else. See, so sometimes they see me when I do that as, oh, there he goes on another weird tangent. Like, why don't we ever focus on the things that we're doing? Well, it's that idea that's gotten us here so far that we need to challenge everything, keep changing, keep growing. And we're not talking about little changes. And it's my thing. So if you're if you're saying, Chris, you're annoyed or frustrated, sometimes I am annoyed and frustrated. It's like, so you got to hear from a stranger to you for you to believe it. But you can't just hear it from me. But I understand that's nature. Well, it's like listening to your parents. You know, you hear it from your parents. They tell you the same thing. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you hear it from a stranger and you're like, oh, <laughs> oh mom, you won't believe right. this idea. <laughs> She's like, I've been telling you that your whole life. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It is. It is human nature. It that's is. interesting. For some people. Well, that's helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And I think that's important, too, to realize when we're just iterating versus innovating. I think there can be innovation while you're iterating because you're going to have to to be able to grow. You always have to do something slightly new and different. Can't be always the same thing. You'll plateau. But you're talking about those massive shifts that will that will yield exponential growth that's yeah. what i'm hearing from you like you you don't want just you know keep growing cool you want the exponential growth i do and I, and because if you have the exponential growth you have exponential results and you keep smashing your goals and you know earlier we were just talking about how i've changed how you've changed and to me the scariest thought in my mind is that i haven't changed at all and i don't want that I'm constantly working on things all the time to to shake things up, to learn new things, to adopt new ideas, and to keep pushing forward. To me, I, I, I put very little value in stock in what was done before. And I can't because I go out into the world and I tell people, be innovative, throw out the baby, just throw out all of it and start over. Keep doing that. And then I can't, with with a reasonable straight face, go and tell an audience that when when in truth, I look back and I'm like, I think we're doing the same thing over and over again, aren't we guys? That's not a good feeling. I don't want to be stuck. Mm -hmm. Being stuck, being at the same place, that's what scares me. So I think you, me, and everybody that's listening to this, we have this very precious gift called life. And your, your time on earth is very finite. It's very short relative to the history of the world and the universe. Yeah, this one moment. Make the most out of your life either to climb some some mountain that so figuratively speaking that you have set out for yourself or to help others in a massive way or to I, I don't know to just to, to leave the planet a little bit better than you found it I, I think this is the thing now I don't think people are necessarily in denial I just think they don't have that kind of ambition in their heart maybe because they were told this is good enough and and maybe it's the discomfort of knowing that you you could ultimately fail that keeps them in this very limited bracket, right? And I, I, I got off a coaching call this morning and I asked them, how much do you want to grow? And they said 10%. I said, 10%? Wow, you set the bar very, very low because relative to what I'm experiencing, the things that I want for my life, I'm setting my bar at 300%. And you will work up to and live up to the goals that you set for yourself. So time to set some new goals and be a lot more ambitious. And it's okay to set a really giant goal, a big, hairy, audacious goal and not hit it. Totally okay. I'm 100% comfortable not doing 300% growth every single year. I get that. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to strive for it. And I don't punish myself. I don't feel depressed when we don't hit it. I just keep going forward. The Jim Rohn quote, which I think I've learned now, which is we need to learn how to be happy with what we have while we pursue all that we want. And those two ideas need to be connected because usually if we're not happy with what we have, then then that means we have a negative outlook on our life when we're constantly chasing something we can never catch. Conversely, if you're complacent, if you're happy with what you have, it means you don't want to pursue more. So I think those two ideas have been separated, whereas I think Jim Rohn brings them together. Be happy with what you have. Love your life. Love your friends and your family and appreciate every single moment that you have while pursuing all that you want. Yes, agreed, 100%. I think that's all my brain can take in. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. 
So Melinda, I guess I will see you next time and we will figure out some new things to tackle. Now, just a quick summary. I think the first thing is to go and seek a mentor, a, a source that you trust. And you don't have to trust them for everything. This is the thing. There is no ideal mentor that's perfectly aligned with your worldview. That's okay. A mentor could just be somebody who's really killing in business, but they may not be a great human being or someone who's a great parent, but not a great business person. Either will work. Find somebody that most closely aligns with what it is that you want to achieve. And then just throw yourself and, and, and be at their feet. And meaning that whatever ideas they share with you, just try it. And try it in an earnest way that you believe it will work and give it a really great effort and try it over and over until you're like, okay, that's not going to work for me. Then find a different mentor. But do that and you'll see that you can achieve so, so much. Now, the analogy here is in The Karate Kid, Daniel miss, meets Mr. Miyagi and he's t getting tired of being bullied by these kids who know karate. And Mr. Miyagi only has one condition which he'll teach him. And he says quite simply, do everything I tell you without question, period. And Daniel's like, yeah, I'm tired of getting my butt kicked. I agree. But he agrees to a degree. So he does things and he's like, what does this have to do with learning karate? So he's like painting the fence and he's washing the car, wax on and wax off. And then finally he can't take it anymore. He's like, I thought you were going to teach me karate. He says, I've been teaching you karate the whole time. He's like, no, you haven't. Then he shows him, wax on, wax off. And he tries to hit him. It's like, oh my gosh, I've been learning this whole time. So that's what it means. Like to submit yourself to your master, to your mentor, to your shifu, to just, just submit and learn. And then once you've learned as much as you can, move on. If you want to grow really fast in life, I recommend this process. So Melinda, my tip to you is just do everything I tell you to do the first time. See what happens. See how far you can go because I believe we're on the same path what I can do is to take the trial and error that I've experienced in my life and help you get there without having to do the same thing that you don't have to fail as often as we've had. Thank you, master. <laughs> <laughs> I need the gong. It's like, dong, there it is. It's done.